Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of my favourite people and some of the country's biggest stars. And we've got one for you today, Arabella Weir. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Alex. How are you? I'm delicious, but not as good as you. There you are for decades, <laughs> entertaining us, making us laugh, and you're coming up to Edinburgh. And with this new show, it's called Does My Mum Loom Big in This? What a lovely title. Thank you, and I uh, imagine you realise what I've done there. There's a long story to this, because it's a sort of a thing of a thing, really, isn't it? This is going back to the book and all of that stuff, and you're sort of using your entire life and being a mum and putting it into an hour of funny, yeah. I guess. So when I came up with Does My Bum Look Big In This for the mm. Far Show and then the uh, international, if I may, best-selling book, um, <laughs> I, and T-shirt and everything else, um, <laughs> that really was a joke I was making out the fact that my mum and dad, but mainly my mum, had gone on and on about how I wasn't the right size and I should lose weight and blah, blah, blah. So I made a joke of it and came up with that character for the Far Show, Does My Bum Look Big In This, and then when I was writing this show, which is about mothers and daughters really but it's also about mothering but it's mainly stories about my incredibly crazy mother I thought of that title first actually and I thought oh no I can't do that because that looks like I'm trying to sort of cash in on does my bum look big in this and then actually as I came up with other titles I thought no no that's the title that sums up this show and sort of most of my life's work which has been you know monetizing my bum I mean, you describe your childhood as dysfunctional. Do any of us have a functional childhood? Our parents are all a bit bonkers, really, aren't they? Let's face it. Well, I think, you know, there's probably no harder job in the world and one for which you don't need any qualifications and for which you don't have to pass any exams or any sort of test. So, you know, it is a bit of a um, a free-for-all parenting. Uh, But I think, I mean, I'm not doing a kind of, you know, one-upmanship, but uh, I would say mine was more dysfunctional than most, Mm -hmm. to put it mildly. You know, I mean, we've all had parents, I mean, I've heard of parents going, well, don't you like doing this, or I forgot to buy that, but I mean, mine was an absolute Mm free-fall. I mean, you know, there was just no no regular meals, no, well, certainly no um, affection, no, it was just criticism and name-calling and competitive... Uh, undermining yeah so this is the show is certainly not a misery fest but it's telling the sort of the most amusing and the most outrageous stories of the stuff my mum did and then contextualizing it with sort of stories about where she came from and her, her, her own upbringing and then all my own experiences and then um and then how hard I tried to be a good mum having felt that I'd been you know very badly brought up myself and then how I embarrass my children. And should we just say it involves Drake? <laughs> Drake, as the Guardian said, the rapper. And I went, there isn't another Drake. <laughs> um, but, and I, that showed how incredibly woke I was. But I went, Drake. And they went, Drake? And I went, Drake? Isn't the biggest star in the world? <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I'm very good at, if I say so myself, inappropriate as it is, um, mm. doing the dance routines from a lot of his videos which is probably the worst thing. My children would definitely say that was child abuse. I would say this is an Edinburgh show in itself. I think we should add in a second show a day, which is you not speaking, just doing the moves of Drake. Now that is a good show. I'm not sure how the not speaking would go, and I might have to give him some PRS money, mightn't I? But um, (laughs) I gather he's quite a nice guy. So um, maybe he'd go, and then you're fine. I read so much about you over the years, and I've seen so much of you, and I wonder whether the core of the issue with your mother was sort of jealousy at the bottom of it. It seems to me she was envious of you from day one, and that seems to have caused most of the stuff. Am I right in thinking that, or have I got the wrong end of the stick? No, Alex, I think, because that's quite an odd concept. Well, it is to me as well, Mm. because I just look at my daughter. I've got a daughter and a son, and I just think aren't they brilliant, aren't they wonderful, I'm so glad they've got that opportunity. But then I'm coming from a perspective of someone who's been, you know, I mean, I put the work in, but I've been very fortunate professionally, things have worked out for me. I don't mean like, you know, I don't mean because I'm an A-lister or something, but, you know, I've done, I've tried hard to be successful at the job I do, and Mm. it's mainly worked out for me. I'm not saying there haven't been pitfalls and tribulations along the way, but, you know, it's easy to be generous when when the world has gone, yeah, I like what you're doing and I'll have some of that. Mm. And I think my mother was unbelievably frustrated, crazily overeducated to end up being a housewife. 
you know, for her generation, she was supposed to look nice in a cocktail dress and do some volivons, but there wasn't much, you know, no one was saying, how would you like to contribute as a professional in mm. whatever field? And so I think you're right. I think that is, I think a lot of what she made her angry was that I was having a crack at the whip and, and keeping going. And I, I think she was very frustrated and, and very simply, as you say, jealous. Mm. I think she was jealous that things hadn't worked out. I mean, you could say, yeah, but you didn't try as hard as I've tried. Um, so I've kind of earned, if you, if you like, my success. But yeah, so I think mum was jealous. And I think, and she did, to be fair to her, she would have these flashes of... Um, uh, I mean, she's dead, by the way, because I had to kill her to do this show. Um, <laughs> um, I couldn't do the show otherwise, but she was fine with that. But she would have these flashes of self-realisation, and she would say, I said to her that I'd met a therapist, and the therapist said was she, she was jealous of me, and she said, yeah, I think I was very jealous of you. So she would have these sort of incredible, honest flashes, and then she'd go, I don't know what you're talking about, why are you wearing that, you look so dreadful, and whatever. Mm. But occasionally, so yeah, I think you're right, I think she was jealous, which is a weird thing, because I don't think parents as being jealous of their children but I think it is possible and then we look at women generally I don't want to get into the me too stuff but if we look back to your mum's generation to your generation and then your daughter's generation it is three literal lifetimes I mean the, the way women are treated now and what they'll be treated like in 30 years time compared to you or your mother it is a different world isn't it yeah but sadly I think the leap from me to my mum is absolutely huge I mean my mother in the 60s was um, not divorced, but estranged from my dad, still had to have written permission from him, even though they were legally separated, to have a bank account and take a job. Mm. Um, you know, it was still... I mean, in the 60s, if a man was unfaithful to his wife, that was normal. But if a woman was unfaithful to her husband, she immediately lost custody of her children because she was an unfit mm. mother. And that's in, you know, most people's lifetimes, or mm. certainly very recent history. But unfortunately, and I think Trump is a very good example, and if I may, Boris Johnson's a very good example, we, the leap between my daughter's generation and mine isn't big enough. You'd mm. like to think that those kind of guys or that kind of behavior uh, is just like a thing of sort of the 1920s or, you know, a whole other era. But I think we're still they're going to have their work cut out for them. But at least the, the, the voice and there's the entitlement. Whereas, yeah, I mean, I've, I've written about that a lot. When I started acting in the late 70s, early 80s, everybody would talk about your body and your breasts and all that thing in a, inverted commas, jokey way. And there was absolutely no, there was no question that you'd go to the producer and say, I'd like to speak to you about that electrician because he just sort of went on about the shape of my bottom. That you, They'd have just gone, oh, yeah, he's like that. Right. Uh, whereas at least my daughter's generation are going to have somewhere to make a formal complaint, if nothing else, mm. you know, and formal complaints about not earning as much. But, you know, you've only got to look at the figures to go, it's not that big a leap. Mm. And then we looked yesterday in the news and you've got the biggest, most powerful man of the free world telling people to go back where they came from and making sexist comments. I mean, Detroit, again, in one girl's case, one's Detroit, one, yeah. you know, Connecticut or something. And it's of note that they're women. Hysterical on the one level that you couldn't write that level of comedy, but to think that this man is actually dictating our future and our freedom is hugely concerning, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I and mean, it's, it's not good. And, and it's depressing that that volume, many millions of Americans think that's a guy who speaks like I do. I know. He's only telling like it is. But I'm afraid to say, I'm not afraid to say, I'm very happy to say, it's more or less what's happening with Boris Johnson. He says ridiculous things about the way Muslim, some women, women, burqa wearing women look, blah, 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 and then just says, oh, it was a joke, or I'm just saying what lots of people think. Hmm. And people aren't rising up in millions. They're going, well, you know, it's sort of what I think. Or, yes, he's just a joke. So it's, yes, it's all a bit frightening. Daughter and son's generation will, I hope, take over the world. Yeah, we've got to keep our fingers crossed. I wonder what it's like being a comedian now. It seems to me people say you can't say anything anymore. You can. It's just whether you should be allowed to say it. What, what's your take on where the line is? Are you up for saying anything? Because, I mean, you've always been opinionated. You've already, already in this yeah. interview, proved you're prepared to say what you think. And there's a lot of people who aren't now. They're too scared, to be honest, with their own opinion. I don't know, because I think any comedian I respect would say, I'm going to say what I want and I'll take the consequences. I think it's much more likely mm. to have a real impact on your career if you're in America. Uh, I think that's been proven many times over. 
that, you know, you can say something and then because of the media and all because whether you were in the right or in the wrong, it's all over for you. You know, there was that, was it last year or something with Cathy Griffin? And it may well have been in poor taste. You know, they, she had the um, uh, an effigy of, of Trump's head uh, beheaded. Now, I'm not saying that was the best joke in the world, nor am no, I it saying it was, in, it was valid, mm. but all it was was a joke. She wasn't inciting violence or something, and that, that's been the end of her on network television. Mm. And you kind of think, is that an appropriate response? So, but I would, I mean, the thing is, one of the great advantages and one of the few advantages of being a bit older as well is that you stop, you just think, I'm just going to tell it like it is. You know old people will do what they want because they're shouting you at the bus stop. Yeah. And you, know, you just sort of think, well, it's chocks away post 50, really. You just think, look, I don't care, I'm going to say what I like. Don't blame you. And you must keep doing that. We love to read. We love to hear. We love to watch you. And you've been there through most of our lives and careers, too. For my generation, you were a pioneer. And I hope you know that. We loved you in the Fast Show, of course, and all that you've done and continue to do. And we can see you at the Assembly George Square Studios, too. And uh, you can see that from the 12th to the 25th of August at the Edinburgh Festival. Is that fun for you to be around your own and to have... 4 p.m., Alex. It's at 4 p.m just so that people know because uh, there are plenty of other people on at the assembly studio too as well uh, I'm on at 4pm uh, I'm really really excited and really really nervous and I feel incredibly lucky to be getting a go at this at, at this stage I just was up at the Edinburgh Festival last year seeing various friends one my age but the rest much younger and I thought I've never done this I'm going to have a go and uh, I feel very lucky that people went yeah because I thought people were going to be going, what? Um, you know, not you. Nobody wants to see anybody your age on stage doing comedy. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I'm very excited. You make it look easy, and you always have. <laughs> I wonder how much you care about it and get neurotic about it. Are you losing sleep at this point, or case or are? Were you crazy? I mean, if your job is trying to make strangers <laughs> like you, of course I'm losing sleep. As if I, if I, at the moment I went, yeah, it'd be fine. I'm just going to turn up and go, yeah, whatever. Uh, I'm here. You paid your money. Who cares? Then it's time to take me out uh, to park the pasture and shoot me. Um, uh, no, I'm incredibly nervous about it because I've still got that performance thing of, you know, I'm making strangers. I'm not making, but strangers who are, are paying money to. Uh, see me and I had better do the best I can possibly do so no I'm absolutely losing sleep about it and going over and over and over and over the material mm. so um, your show might be rubbish but at least you got the best title at the fringe this year does my <laughs> mum loom big in this by Arabella Weir will be performing 4pm at the Assembly George Square Studios and uh, you can see her from the 12th to the 25th of August at the Edinburgh Festival thank you so much for your time it's been a joy talking to you thank you very much Alex it's